Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Parenting Reframe Podcast. You'll just have to bear with me today. I'm fighting a little bit of a cold, so if I sound a little stuffy, I hope I don't start to cough, but I'll make this one short and brief. So a lot of you messaged me and have watched the download or the recording that I have of the webinar that I did teaching parents how to implement PAR, which stands for Pause, Acknowledge, Respond, Reflect, in your own homes and in your own parenting journey. So I've gotten a lot of messages messages asking if I can kind of do a quick mini-sode on the podcast, really highlighting the steps in PAR, and just kind of walking parents through kind of the cliff notes of that recording and what it entails and what we want to think about. So at its inception, PAR for me developed only for myself. I wanted a way to move from feeling reactive towards my kids to feeling more responsive. And I would say in general, I would describe myself as a very calm person. I have always innately just been that way. But when you parent your kids versus working with kids, be it as a teacher or now as a speech therapist or in a coaching session, whatever the case might be, your own kids are going to bring something different out in you. It's a very um, integrated relationship is how I would describe it, meaning I think our kids are brought to us and we are brought to them in sort of a very specific way, you know, without getting too woo-woo. I'm a very spiritual person, so I believe it is a very much a purposeful connection. And I do believe that our kids are meant to grow us in the ways that we're supposed to continue growing while we simultaneously help them grow in ways that they need to grow and become who they need to be in their lives. So with that, when my kids were younger and they were little, I actually wasn't that reactive. It was sort of my sweet spot. I felt very comfortable with younger children. I didn't really waver when tantrums happened, when we hit different phases. And part of that is because of the fact that my background is in early childhood and I felt very equipped and um, sort of able to handle those things. I sort of felt like I knew what to do. Did I get everything right every time? I mean, not at all. But it, it, I could sort of coast. It felt okay to me. It wasn't until my kids started to get a little bit older and they started to crave independence. And that's when I became a little bit lost. That's when I couldn't really find my footing and I didn't really know how to respond, what to say, what was a yes, what was a no, what were the boundaries I was needing to set, how much was I supposed to parent and how much do you start to let go. And so this was probably in the middle school years. And that's a really kind of interesting time in terms of development. We have a lot of hormonal fluctuations with kids. Um, It's that preteen, early teen years. They do believe they know everything. So that can also feel very irritating as a parent. So there's a lot to kind of unpack in that age range in terms of like what kids are actually going through developmentally speaking. But for me, what started to happen is I became a parent who was parenting more from a I would say a fearful place. Like I wanted to just say no to everything and just keep them safe. So if they wanted to go out with friends and they were friends that I didn't know, the answer was no. If they wanted to go to somebody's house and I didn't know who that person was, the answer was no. Um, It just, and it wasn't that it was just a no. It was a no and no more talking about it. It was a no with no further discussion. It was a no with I'm already annoyed that you even asked me that question, right? There was very little room to converse. So when I say reactive parenting, that's what I mean. What was happening was, is I was coming from a fearful place myself, but it was unrecognized or unrealized. They were triggering that fear in me when they were asking to do things that felt uncomfortable to me. I would react with a very swift no and somewhat meanly too, like no and don't you dare ask again kind of a thing. And essentially it left them confused. It also left them frustrated because in large, I'm not usually the kind of parent who doesn't open the door for conversation with them. So I think they saw this shift in me and they were unsure of what to do. Same with my husband, right? He was sort of like, why Why are we saying no all the time? Like everyone was a little bit lost during this phase of parenting because we weren't sure like what, what was for us to say yes to and what, what do we pull back on? So long story short, I recognized in myself and I sort of saw in myself this reactivity that didn't feel right. It didn't feel like who I wanted to be as their parent. I didn't like how I was stifling whatever it was that they were trying to communicate. I didn't like that while they were trying to explore this new independence that I couldn't kind of get in there with them and help them explore 
what it feels like to do things independently and to make mistakes and to recover and to repair. Like those are really critical parts. And I knew that on a cerebral level, but it was just so hard for me to let go as a parent. So for me, actually, when I think of PAR and its inception, reflecting kind of came first and pausing, if that makes sense. And then I worked through the middle, meaning I started to kind of go, hmm, like, why am I why am I saying no all the time? Why am I, why are we having these weird exchanges where I'm just really kind of short and curt and not talking to them about why and letting them ask questions? So that sort of stuck out. And then I started to just observe myself. And that's the first part of PAR is we want to teach ourselves to pause. And when I say pause, I don't mean like go in a room in your home and meditate for 10 minutes like we all know I meditate by the way and I'm a big believer that it is a wonderful practice however I also recognize that in the throes of a parenting moment where you are about to react it's usually because something is happening that needs our immediate attention we can't just go I'm just going to go step away right now and take some deep breaths like that's not always feasible sometimes it is but in a lot of instances that's not feasible so Look at pausing in the context of how it would work in your home, depending on the phase of parenting that you're in. So for me, with my kids in those preteen years, it was feasible for me to say, you know what, I'm going to think about what you just asked me. Give me a minute. I want a few minutes to think about it because I really want to process it. And I'm going to talk to you about it in just a little bit. I could do that because they were a little bit older. They knew how to tolerate waiting at that point. If you are in the middle of a tantrum kind of phase, if you're with toddlers or preschool age kiddos, that's not always going to be available to you. So you want to think about reframing how you're going to pause. But pausing is really the brief second where you either breathe, you can rub your hands together, you can kind of feel the ground under your feet. These are little tactics that I give parents when I coach them about how they can really just steady themselves because ultimately you almost want to have this meta experience where you're like observing yourself outside of your body. You're almost looking down and going like, whoa, what was that big blow up right there? You know, or why am I getting so heated in that moment? Or or what do I need to really allow myself to stay kind of regulated while my child is completely dysregulated. So it can be one second. It can be literally just taking your hands and rubbing them together. In some cases, it can be stepping away and giving yourself a few minutes. But look at the context of where you are in your parenting journey and what you think that pause might look like. And again, in coaching, you know, I do two-month coaching programs with parents one-on-one. We really work on this if it's something that is a need for you, and we really come up with a tangible way for you to access the pause, particularly if you have developed a pattern of reactivity. So once you pause, you just want to acknowledge. Only acknowledge that you feel triggered. You don't have to go into a lengthy why explanation here. You don't need to justify the trigger. You don't need to even do anything more other than take one second and go, I am feeling really triggered right now. I'm about to lose it. I feel like yelling. I feel irritated. Whatever it is, you just want to name it internally. I'm not even saying out loud. You just want to acknowledge your state. If you can't do the pause and the acknowledge, you will always lean on reactivity. We overreact when we our backs are against the wall and we don't know what else to do and we feel afraid. And so we lash out, we yell, we might resort to sort of fear tactics to get our kids to stop doing the thing we don't want them to do. But whatever it is, it's not our best. It's not the thing we really want to be doing, but we just feel like we can't do anything else. So pausing acknowledging are at least going to bring your state of mind into a better place so that then you can jump into that third part, which is respond. And notice it's not react, it's respond, right? And then we want to think about what do we need for the situation that we're in. So for me, back to my example of my kids kind of craving independence, me being pretty fearful and saying no to everything, I paused I acknowledged I felt triggered that they were asking to do something that induced a lot of fear in me. But I also recognized that that fear wasn't theirs to carry. It was mine to work through. And I also didn't want to bring my kids up in a world where I wanted them to look through the lens of fear at everything that they were seeing. I wanted them to have kind of a thoughtful way of processing things, but I didn't want it to be fear-based. I really did not. So I knew that. So now I just respond. And in those cases, I would say something like, I need two minutes to think about what you're asking me. Or sometimes 
I would think about it then, and my response might have still been no. It's not that the response was wrong. It was the way I was delivering the information. And yes, sometimes they were disappointed that it was still a no, but that was okay. My job is sometimes to disappoint my kids, and they know that. And it's not because disappointing them in a way of not showing up. It's that sometimes I have to set those boundaries that they don't like, me and my husband both. But they also understand that. And I can tell you is now having kids that are older and kind of being able to process it and look back at it, they're grateful. I mean, they say that to me now, you know. So when you're in sort of the eye of the storm, it's hard to kind of go fast forward and recognize like where will this take my kids later. But if you make it a real conscious effort to kind of show up for them in a way that they need, over time, they will recognize that and appreciate it. So my response completely changed. And sometimes my response was yes. And sometimes my response was recognizing that I had to let go and that I had to trust and that I had to recognize that he needed to make mistakes. I'm speaking of my son in this case because he's older. That he needed to kind of kind of have opportunities to process and think about decision making without me or my husband there. Those were all really important things. And I also wanted him to not feel afraid to come to us. So if I was going to kind of create a parenting environment where everything was no from a fearful place and I was going to give that fear to him because that's what ends up happening, then he would have become very fearful in the decisions he was going to make as he continues to grow. Then we have a situation where he would fear coming to us out of making a mistake. He wouldn't come because he would recognize that we're kind of steering the ship from this place of being fearful all the time. So it was really important that I recognize that. And that's where that reflection, that second R, comes into place in part. I had to sit with myself at the end of the day. You don't want to reflect right in the moment. You need some space and time. And I had to really look at things like, okay, why is that bothering me? Why am I saying no all the time? What is it really about? And for me, it was like a very new territory. I didn't know how to parent kids that were 12 and 13 and 14 and wanted to bike ride distances that felt unreasonable to me or wanted to go to somebody's house who I didn't know. Like, how could I kind of work through that and and what was coming up for me? And ultimately, what I just described is what I found is that I didn't want to be parenting them from this fearful place. And so my husband and I kind of worked out new boundaries that we wanted to set, but also we recognized we needed to let go. We needed to give them both kids space. We needed to kind of recognize and be okay with the fact that they were going to fall and they were going to have to pick themselves back up. We needed to create environments where mistakes could happen and could also be discussed. So it took time. But in that reflection is when I recognized that it was my own insecurities, my own fear, my own desire to control that was leading to that situation. And the tricky thing in parenting is like when your kids are younger, yes, you are the one who's controlling more things. But as they get older, it asks us to do the opposite. And we have to sort of let go and let go and control less and control less. And that becomes so hard, right? Because it's not what we're used to. That sense of control gives us a sense of safety, albeit I think it's a fallacy. But in our minds, right, from that cerebral parenting place, we feel like we're the ones in charge. So as that starts to shift and we have to give that space for our kids to really become more resilient, more competent, more intuitive in their decision making, they have to be able to kind of navigate different scenarios without us. It's a whole other set of challenges, but I had to recognize that and PAR is how I did that. So that's sort of the cliff notes of PAR. Um, You know, I wanted to give a short little example of how it came up for me. And that's one of many, many, many examples. If you want to watch the, um, I think it's an hour long, the recording is, will be in the show notes if you wanted to download that. It's totally free. For me, that is my way of saying to parents, please just recognize the importance of this tool. Um, It really changed the trajectory of how I parented. It also changed the rest of my relationships, in all honesty, because I use it in all forms of communication. It's made me a better listener. It's made me very aware of myself and how much of that is interfering with whatever the dilemma is in front of me. It also helps me to be more thoughtful in the way I kind of present information and in the way I give an answer. And it also helps me really learn and excavate some of those things that are there that are either insecurities or maybe there are things that make me go, hmm, like, why am I still holding on to this? What is that kind of voice in my head saying? It's a really important process if you're really interested in kind of expanding, learning more about yourself. I'm a big believer in living an expansive life, continuing to grow yourself simultaneously while you grow your kids. You know, we're not done learning. We never really are. So par for me is that sort of roadmap to allow for that growth to continue to happen. And ultimately, the result is that you find your steadiness as a parent. You start to find a little bit of ease in the way you set boundaries. 
and your kids begin to really benefit as well because you are a pretty calm, grounded place for them to go to regardless of whatever the situation is. So hope you found that helpful. I hope you can use these tools and access them in your own life. But if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out and you could always um, book a free discovery call if you feel like you wanted to really implement these tools in your day-to-day life and figure out how PAR could be useful to you. So until next time, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever it is that you're listening right now. And what really makes my day is if you share or recommend the podcast to a friend. It is the greatest compliment. If you have not already, head on over to theparentingreframe.com where you can subscribe to get my weekly newsletter, Parenting Skimmed. 10 sentences delivered to your inbox every Thursday to help you parent and live a better life. It's for the parent who constantly told me, I just don't have time to read. Make sure to come and say hi to me on Instagram at The Parenting Reframe. My DMs are always open and I love hearing from you. Until next time, this is Albiona. Albiona.